What type of wood are you using to fire this thing up? A uh, cedar. Okay. And this is slab wood off of our sawmill here. We we saw cedar. Okay. And uh, so it's just just scrap. scrap I understand. From the sawmill. I understand. I don't think we have any cedar trees that grow quite that large in West Texas. <laughs> yeah. They have lots of cedars, but they don't tend to thrive very well. How many cubic feet is the firebox? I don't think, I don't even know. Okay. I don't know. Do you know how many cubic feet these fireboxes generally are? Roughly four feet deep, two feet wide. So there's a, that'd be eight square feet times uh, at least three. So 24, 24 square feet, yeah. 24 square feet. Yeah. Something like that. I know okay. it's big enough to get in. It's big enough. It's big we get enough. in there when we ultrasound the boilers. We have to oh, get yeah. in there. Oh, wow. My dad's a bigger guy than I am, and me and my dad have both been inside this with water pressure to clean it. Wow. So, Interesting. I'm sure it would depend on what type of wood that's put in there. Uh, how long generally does a. Do you have to keep. Loading it just like on yeah. a locomotive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Load this throughout the day. Okay. Well, that kind of makes sense. So there must be some sort of a uh, ash dump or an ashtray or something got, of that nature. You got uh, doors. You got doors you open up on each side. And then you take a rake and break it out. Oh, okay. And uh, you can clean all your ashes and everything out the front or clean them up the back. Okay. You just do that about once a day. Then you'll you'll uh you got tubes that run through your boiler and you'll clean them out every morning. Yeah, I noticed you got both of you guys doing that. And now I see there's actually a little door that keeps yeah. those tubes covered up so that they don't uh, cool off when you're running. Well that that door just to access them. You close okay. that so it'll keep the smoke going out the stack to keep a good draft going. Okay, okay. Interesting. Well, these machines are in surprisingly good shape for as old as they are, I would think. Well, they've been, this one's been handed down through the generations and been kept up, I'm sure. Both of these have. Okay. Uh, this one's been in my family since early seven. Wow. Now the next thing I was going to bring up is lubing. It's like you're getting prepared to do that. Yeah, this is this is steam wool. This will help mix with the steam and goes into the cylinder. Okay. Lubricates the piston. Okay. It's about a 600 weight oil, isn't it? Yeah, 600 weight. It's got tallow in it, and it's I think it's one of the few oils that actually mixes with water. Wow. Now, tallow, that makes kind of sense. Yeah. Uh, 
That's kind of like adding a little bit of oil to a two cycle uh, Pretty much. engine fuel. <laughs> and then, been using water boiler treatment to help, keep, help make the boilers survive rust and scale a little better. Uh, use regular grease on the gearing. You got grease cups scattered throughout the engine instead of grease search. You top them grease cups off every morning. Make sure everything's greased, ready to go. Right, right. Uh, you got bad bearings in there that you'll go in, go ahead and roll in every morning. Okay. You get everything situated so you're good to run for the day. Uh, no harder when we run them. We just do this in the morning. If you're running them wide open every day, all day, every day, you'd be greasing them, oiling them a little Quite a bit. Better. Right, right. I think it's going to be a beautiful day today. I think it is too. Yes, sir. Now, how long would you estimate, if you just lit that fire, how long will you estimate that it would be ready to start producing enough steam to run? An hour and a half, two hours. Okay, all right. Yeah. How many gallons of water would be in the boiler? 250 gallons. Wow. Once the fire gets hot, we'll switch over to coal. Okay. Ah. It's like the hard coal. Yes. I remember as a kid, there were still steam engines running through Pecos, Texas. I was always kind of fascinated by those hard black rocks that could burn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and they burn hot. With the expansion and contraction with heat, we don't force feed these in the mornings. We, you know, we try to ease them up to temperature. Right. You could get them hot a lot quicker. Yeah. But it's just a lot more stress on the boiler. Yeah. That's understandable. Is there a big concern about uh, the water that is put into the border? No. In some areas of, of uh, Texas that I'm familiar with, there is a lot of gypsum in the water, which over a period of time really does the number on water heaters in people's homes. <laughs> yeah, and you'll get a lot, of, you can pick up a lot of trash in the water and you'll, it'll, it'll build up but uh, these things were designed to be sucking water out of ponds. Ah, uh, yeah. Creeks. There you go. And, you know, you, when these were built, you didn't have running water. There you go. Whatever water you could get your hands on is what water you ran. Yeah, that makes sense. So the boilers can be cleaned out fairly easily? The boilers be cleaned out fairly easy. You got, well, uh, you can see on the back of this one. You got these handhold plates scattered all over okay. the boiler every every engine has those okay. some some form or another you can pull them out and it gives you access to the bottom of the boiler gives you access above your crown sheet where you can clean all that out i see you can take a uh, power washer clean it out take an air hose blow it out right right uh, get all your rust all your scale all your trash off the bottom okay Lots of maintenance then. Lots of maintenance. 
we're spo so spoiled these days where you know we just jump in a vehicle go. twist the key and go <laughs> don't really think about it as a matter of fact uh, a lot of younger people today they don't even think about changing their oil no. in their engine that kind of thing you know they just I guess it's a good thing that electric vehicles are starting to come around and as long as they can remember to charge the batteries. Well, as long as they can remember to plug them in at night. There you go. <laughs> There's hardly anything was really that easy back in the 1800s. No. It took so much manual labor to do just about anything back then. And it took a team of guys to keep them going. Yeah. So you would, you would, if you're sitting stationary, you would have had a guy sitting here running this engine. You would have had, you would have had a team of guys going after water, firewood, coal. Yeah. Uh, consistently, and then you had a group of guys either running, running the thrasher, running the sawmill. If you right. on the plow, you had a team of guys on the plow. Yeah. It. It was work. Yes, certainly. Perhaps a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think about, and that is that these uh, old time machines like this were used stationary quite a bit just to power other types of equipment. Yeah. We've, they've been a lot brought in where they was they set up stationary, they had the wheels knocked off, set on wood blocks, and that's where they sat. Yeah. And I presume. I'll be seeing some demonstrations of some of that type of stationary work today, won't I? Yeah. Uh, somebody will be on the sawmill today. Uh, somebody will be crashing wheat today. Uh, and somebody will hook onto that house and pull it around the ground. And All right. I don't think anybody <laughs> going, I think the ground's too hard to plow this year. Oh, is that right? Uh, we ain't had no rain. Oh. Uh, hey, in fact, I'm from about two hours east of here, and it's drier there. Wow. Uh, our grass is dying. Wow. Don't have to worry about mowing the yard at the moment. Right. I follow a fellow who raises a small bison herd in what it's called the Cross Timbers area. I can't remember exactly which little town is close by, but. He has really been complaining about not having enough water for his pastures. Yeah. Well, I had the camera turned off, but we just got to talking about uh, how well the metal has held up on these old tractors and uh, found out that some metal work such as this, which is kind of thin, has been replaced on these. Uh, uh, this is your Water, water holding tank? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, that makes sense that that would eventually wear out. Has it got to looking up here? Uh, this appears to be some type of a pump. Steam injector. It's a steam injector, okay. Um, so the there's bound to be uh, some type of, uh, not washers, but uh, uh, Usually there's some leather, what is it called, yeah, that needs to be replaced. There wouldn't be anything there's like nothing in, there that needs to be nothing in the injector. Is that right? Okay. In fact, okay. Those injectors are probably original to the engine or original to an error correct engine. Okay. Um, there's no, it's all brass on the inside, steel. I see. Okay. There, there's no, there's nothing in them to wear. Huh. Okay. Uh, how, how does the water get transported up into the, the boiler? With that injector. Okay. It sucks it out of the tank with boiler steam. 
pushes it back in the boiler. Oh, okay. So no mechanical parts really needed there. No mechanical there. parts. Okay. Anything else is kind of unique to uh, maintaining this type of machinery that you can think of? Uh, we ultrasound the boilers every five years. <clears throat> wow. Um, we have to be state inspected. We hydro the boilers every year. We have to check all the safety. Yeah, year. we have to check all the safety factors. I see. Now, the boilers themselves, were they manufactured in such a way that they could be easily replaced or? No. Oh, really? No, okay. A boiler for an engine like this, to take it somewhere, would be between sixty dollars and $80,000 to put a boiler on it. Wow. Very time consuming. They're all riv hand riveted. And right, okay. Very, very time consuming to build a boiler. Yeah. Yeah, you can see some of the rivets here. And I'm glad that's just warm. Yeah. <laughs> Later today, you won't want to touch. Right, I, that just occurred to me that uh, that was probably not a real smart thing to do. <clears throat> and steering looks like it's works by chain drive. Chain, uh, yeah. Incredible. You can get a better view of this when you've got water tank. This is pretty much your steering box. Okay. And you just got to shaft that runs across there with them chains on it. Pulls it one way or the other. Incredible. All manual steering. Once you got into the deck size up from this, you, you can have power steering, steam operated. Oh, wow. Uh, which made it a little nicer. Yeah. Uh, these, none of these machines have them. All right. And if you're not moving, you're not turning. Gotcha. <laughs> now, does it use an actual steering wheel that we're familiar with today, yeah. or? Oh, okay. It has an actual steering wheel on it. It's. Yeah. Have to get over here. You don't have no foot pedals, so you got an actual steering wheel up there. Right. You, got a, you got a lever for your throttle, you got a lever for your clutch. Okay. You got a lever for your uh, more or less gear shift. Okay. Which switches the engine from forward to reverse. Okay. You don't you don't have an actual transmission, you just uh, you switch the valving around and turn the engine around the other direction to go forward and back. I'm presuming it would take a number of turns of the steering wheel to yeah. actually turn very much. <laughs> you, you get after it. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, it, it just ain't. You're. Yeah. You're working it. Okay. Now, would these be running stationary once you get them fired up? Or? Depends who's doing what. We ain't okay. we ain't uh, started the discussion of who's gonna do what. Today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll normally discuss that over breakfast. All right. Mighty fine.
Anyway, Jerome has the uh, whistle off of our train over there, the number 20, 25, 22. He has the whistle off of that train on his steam engine, so he likes to play around with it. Okay, next we've got another Kane family tractor. This is Marvin, who might be related to Jerome, if any of you know him. This is a 1922. It's a 2040 oil pole. This is, this is a traction engine. I got straightened out on that yesterday. This is not a steam engine. That's a steam engine up there. We're having school here for Mark. Anyway, these gas tractors were the first improvement over the steam engine. If you notice, even though they're still big, they were much smaller and much more maneuverable than the engines powered by steam. And of course, they were a lot easier to work on. And if you notice, the exhaust goes through the oil there, and that cools the engine. So that was their idea with Rumley, was to cool the engine in that way. And then you also didn't have to worry about freezing. This is Mervyn Kane from Fairview. Isn't there like a driver's license you have to have? You have to go to like steam school to drive this? You, you don't even look qualified. Six times, six times Levi's been to driving school and he still can't, still can't do it. He's got to have two assistants. Anyway, this is the engine that belongs to Cummins Construction. They're from Enid. And this is a Baker brand steam engine. It's a model 2390, it's 20 horsepower, and it's a 1923 model. And the Cummins family bought this new, and I told the story yesterday that it came in on a rail car, and first it was all in pieces, and so they had to put the engine together on the rail car, and then fire it up and drive it off of the car. So this is Cummins Construction from Enid. And if anybody didn't know, that's Levi driving. He's the guy who does all the work here. Okay, next we've got another steam engine. This is exciting. This is a steam show. We've got 10 of them. That's always our goal, 10 steam engines. This is Chad and Anna Kelly, and they're from Pawnee. This is a case. It's a 1920 model, and it has 50 horsepower. And this engine was delivered to the Wright brothers in Cushing. And it's been in Pawnee for many years working at their show. And the previous owners included Kenneth Kelly and Bill Jennings. But now it's owned by Chad and Anna Kelly from Pawnee. And they're, they bring it here every year to our show. This is a Case 1920 50 horsepower. Older than the others, we had 20s, 21s, 22s. This is an 11. 
1911 with a runway that makes 25 horsepower. This engine was purchased in 2018 from the Carpenter family. So you notice that these uh, engines get passed around from one family to another. tractors they built the steam engine this is a 1919 this is a Minneapolis Moline it's a model 2890 and what that means is that it has 28 horsepower on the draw bar or 90 on the flywheel so it can do considerably more work on the flywheel because there's no power being robbed from the drivetrain this is Floyd and Lita Kelly and they're from Rolleston, Oklahoma. That's a long ways, too. They've owned this steam engine since 1974, and they bought it. All right, yeah, he bought it from Art Costed. There we go, yes, uh-huh. Carolyn says that you're not old enough to have bought it in 1974. Well, that's a good, good, that's close. steam engines. Now we're going to look at a tractor or a traction engine, as I learned yesterday. This is belongs to Ed Lyons. He's from Enid. He, he graciously lets the people around here work on it and store it and drive it. This is a Rumley oil pull. This is a Model B and it's a 2545. It's a 1912 model, and the Lyons family has owned this since new. So it's pretty amazing that it's still running around and in usable condition. This is about the largest gas engine that you'll ever see around this part of the country. This is the Ed Lyons family from Eden. Are you going to get hot? Yeah. 